Uh, hi, I'm Stephanie, and this is Art History Storytime. Today I'd like to talk about someone who should be more of a household name as far as architects go, but for some reason isn't. This guy was doing eco-friendly sustainable design before it was cool. Horace Henry Gifford II was born in Vera Beach, Florida on August 7th, 1932. The Giffords were a middle-class family, but with higher social standings. You see, his great-grandfather, Henry T. Gifford, along with his wife, Sarah, are considered to be the first to establish modern-day Vera Beach, Florida. So Horace and the Gifford family have roots here. And I say here because I'm in Vera Beach right now. And I can tell you it's just, it's just quiet enough, the traffic is low, everyone knows each other, the beaches are clean, the weather's beautiful. But stop moving here, though. I mean it. Baby Horace grew up in this idyllic, quaint coastal town. In his youth, which would have been in the 40s and 50s, this place was a lot smaller and undeveloped. So he got an experience that was very close to nature. The beauty of the ocean, the sand dunes, the Indian River, the surrounding scrublands. It all really stuck with him as this place he felt deeply connected to in his formative years. He found solace in the landscape and was described as addicted to water because of how much time he'd spend in the river and in the ocean. Young Horace was nothing like his rugged, pioneer-descendant father, though, who was a real meat-and-potatoes kind of guy. Instead, our boy was into the arts, music, and especially theater. When it was time for college, he was off to the University of Florida at Gainesville by the influence of his uncle, a physician. But that didn't work out. See, it wasn't medicine that tickled his brain, so he switched his major to architecture. He was a quiet, yet severely charming and charismatic guy in his early 20s perhaps even a little full of himself. He was also confidently and openly gay, which for college campus standards was passable, but for the world in the 1950s and the mid-century, no, still taboo. After graduation, Horace spent some time working under a few established architects in New York City, then Pennsylvania, then back to New York. Although it was the career he wanted, he saw this position with architect J. Gordon Carr in New York as just a day job that fueled his other interests, like personal projects, theater, the arts, partying in the city. Eventually, with how the social tides go, he wound up one summer night hanging out at somebody's beach house on Fire Island Pines. Fire Island is a 31 mile long, but hardly a quarter mile wide, Barrier Island, protecting Long Island, New York from the forces of the Atlantic Ocean. It consists of 18 communities of coastal dwellings and a few commercial businesses here and there. You used to only be able to reach Fire Island by ferry, and many parts of it are still car-free. The place is a constructed oasis for the urbanite with the means to escape the fast-paced grime and toil of the city and retreat to nature. It's a place with a flair of exclusivity, where one goes to chill out, socialize, and entertain. These are little luxuries many are deprived of in the city with their highly demanding jobs and fast-paced lifestyles. Certain areas of the island, like Cherry Grove, have a history of being a hotspot for artists and theater types and the gay community. The weirdos and the avant-garde really carved out their home spot on the island. It was a place where they weren't judged or policed, a place where they felt free to be themselves. Because remember, it most literally was a crime to be gay back in the day. So this is the place Horace stumbled upon in the late 1950s or 1960. While the community of Cherry Grove did have a negative reputation for its homosexual populace, the Pines, which was just a short walk away, was seen as much more respectable. <clears throat> Bullshit. There was a clear separation of morals and class. People will find a reason to be a snob about anything. At this time, there were a few beautifully modernist beach houses popping up amongst the dunes. And in 1961, Horace Gifford started building his own house in the Pines. It didn't get much attention, but what did get attention was Gifford's flirtatious self, who landed his first Fire Island client by seducing him. It was a client he shamelessly swept away from a more established architect on the island. And so begins Horace Gifford's career as a beach house architect. He was only 28 when he began designing these beach houses. A student, a baby, and yet his work was so refined and complete. Like he wasn't trying too hard to make things work well, although they did. And at the same time, he was offering something new and refreshing that felt right at home in the landscape that it sat in. His houses were humble, both in size and material choice. They were modernist shelters of cedar and glass with high ceilings. 
No paint to hide a surface's true character. No unnecessary walls to block airflow, conversation, and light. And as an ode to homosexual pride, no closet doors. Anywhere. Nobody is in the closet in this beach house. This was architecture specifically designed to support leisure life and socializing. These floor plans were for life in vacation mode, and these material choices enveloped it with a vibe of masculinity and modern, pared-down aesthetics for those wealthy gay men who partied on the island all summer long. His style was a much softer take on modernism that cared for organic forms and natural materials. Gifford was doing eco-friendly sustainable design way before it was cool. Because of his strong connection and love to his coastal town of Vero Beach, I think he valued things like preserving the land, capturing its best views, and using raw materials for the inherent quality that they have to offer. Many of his houses were on posts, like stilts, which brought them up above the dunes where they could catch fresh airflow for passive cooling and bring the ocean into view. What a sin it would be to flatten the sand in order to plop a shoebox house on it. Instead, these houses really integrated into the environment by sort of hugging the dunes and fitting snugly into the trees. Outdoor space was so important that many had huge decks or porches in order to extend the living areas outward. The exterior front entries always played a little coy. There was never a straight and clear route to the front door. Instead, visitors had to weave around dunes and beach grass on curvy paths before arriving. It was flirtation, maybe more like foreplay. Bedrooms were kept small and super simple so that they were just for sleeping and other things. He wanted you to spend time out there at the party, in the yard, at the magnificent beach just a short hop away, not cooped up in the bedroom. Gifford may not have been the originator of the sunken living room, but the conversation pit and the makeout loft, which was a signature of his, were tools in his architectural toolbox that helped bring the gay men of the island just a little closer. That and a preference for creating voyeuristic setups. We are not shy here with our walls of glass. One might be surprised at what can be seen while strolling by a Gifford house on a balmy summer night. The expanse of windows in his designs let in light and views, but also enticed friends to stop on by. As I said, they were designed for socializing. In total, Horace Gifford planned and executed 63 homes on Fire Island. He didn't even have his own architectural license all those years. He just used his colleagues' signature to submit plans. He had made some bad educational decisions, and he got arrested once, which prevented him from getting his own license. But still, that didn't stop him. Overall, he remained active in his career until about 1985. His beach houses have been the stage for many a good time. Partying, debauchery, orgies. There was even a gay porn film there. A little film titled Boys in the Sand. The houses inspired his clients, and the community of the Pines inspired books, such as the 1978 novel Faggots by Larry Kramer. Unfortunately, his life and mental state really took a downturn in his later years. Gifford contracted AIDS and died on April 6, 1992 from its complications at the age of 59. His name basically sank into obscurity despite having had such an impact on the island. I happen to have found his name who knows how many layers deep into a Wikipedia rabbit hole. What stood out primarily to me was his hometown. That simple commonality is what made me want to go back and see what he was all about. Architect and historian Christopher Wallens has an amazing book titled Fire Island Modernist, Horace Gifford and the Architecture of Seduction. It's where a lot of the general information about Gifford for this video comes from. I recommend you check that book out for the in-depth story and all of the scrumptious visuals of his architecture that I can't really include here. I also really like how he chronicled Gifford's career toward the end in the context of the architect's declining mental and physical health and the shifts in American culture that contributed to him going into obscurity. There's also a Hulu film now called Fire Island. I just started watching it last night. It's cute. The story takes place in present day, and I'm not sure if they touch on the architecture at all or not, but we'll see. It's so coincidental that I chose to look at Gifford now, and this came out just in June. It's so weird. I didn't know about that before I started this. Gifford's family home still stands at the corner of Route 60 and 9th Avenue here in Vero Beach. For the decade or so that I've lived in this area, I've watched it be this sad, old, decrepit, dilapidated thing, but in the last few years an investor has purchased it and has begun renovations, and now it's bright and shiny. And just a few weeks ago, another sign of divine timing, after I started writing this video, I noticed a gate go up that reads Gifford, 
so it's my guess and hopes that the conservation efforts will be available for the public. I love a Florida cracker with some good bones. The house. I'm talking about the house. The architectural style, you know, known as Florida cracker. If you enjoyed this video, I'd deeply appreciate it if you'd hit that like button and subscribe for more art-related content.